Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. We made it through another week. And guess what? IT Expo, the tech super show, is back in a couple of short weeks in Fort Lauderdale. We have a couple of great guests to chat about the big day, the big week, as well as uh, tech trends. Uh, Rich Tarani, how are you? Hey, how are you, Evan? How's it going? I'm great for a Friday. Uh, Bill Miller, how are you? I'm fantastic. And it's not just Friday, it's every day. <laughs> every day is Friday when you're living every the dream. Every day is Friday. <laughs> uh, but let, let's do some introductions, uh, Rich, to yourself. And for those few people who don't know about IT Expo, the tech super show that's happening, give us give us a backstory. It's quite a, an intriguing story, a long-storied uh, company uh, TMC and IT Expo as well. Thanks. Uh, the show's 25 years old. This is the biggest show we've ever done. Uh, the largest uh, registration uh, that we've ever had. Uh, most exhibitors, most speakers. Uh, it is going to be the place to be if uh, you are an enterprise, a medium sized company, all the way down to small, or if you're a reseller, MSP, uh, communications carrier. Uh, channel partner, uh, all of those groups come to IT Expo, and the reason they do so is they are looking for products, services, techniques, uh, networking opportunities to boost their business via the latest uh, software, cloud, hardware, whatever it is that they need to improve their business, their productivity, and uh, basically uh, reduce costs and stay competitive. Wow. That's a mic drop moment. Is there anyone who shouldn't be there in the B2B and enterprise tech space? Uh, you know, it's not a consumer show. So <laughs> to, the extent, to the extent that consumer and business is merging to some degree, and it is, right? It, some, like, for example, you know, mobile phones at some point were consumer, then they merged uh, over. The web browser was actually consumer and then merged into business. So, you know, if it's a consumer only product, then it, it's probably not going to be ideal, for example, you know, like some kind of fitness monitoring device or something like, we, you know, that's not something we would suggest at the show. We had CES just a couple of weeks ago for that. And that was phenomenal. Correct. Correct. Right. So that's the difference. We're really a business show for business purposes and not a consumer show. So, you know. Granted, there's crossover, like, you know, for example, the, the communications carriers will come to our show. They will, for example, sometimes they'll find a phone vendor who's at the show and they'll use that phone vendor's phones and buy, you know, millions of them and send them out to their customers who are consumers. So, or, or an internet gateway, a broadband gateway. But still, that's a business. We think of that as a business purchase, right? Because the carrier, the communications carrier is buying that and providing that to their consumer customers, if that makes sense. Oh, totally, totally does. And it really is a who's who of the enterprise tech world and SME tech world there. It's really an exciting destination. Uh, next guest here, Bill Miller. Uh, we haven't chatted in a while. Would love nope. to hear what you're up to lately. And what's new, Bill? What's new? Well, so, um, you know, I've known Rich for 25 years because I met him, I think, at probably the first IT Expo when his dad was still around and walking the floors when I was with Fujitsu. So mm -hmm. I go back a couple of years here and been with a few companies and I've been involved with IT Expo for uh, a pretty good part of that time. I've, I've been an exhibitor and a sponsor. I've been a speaker at many. I mean, I did mm -hmm. the case study Dallas Cowboys back in 2000 and I think it was five or six. Five, I think it was five when I was with 3Com when they were still a 3Com customer. Uh, and, uh, and I've been, you know, I worked with TMC to bring the asterisk world to the open source platform to with Digium uh, to IT Expo. So I have a pretty good relationship with all of the TMC team. Fantastic people. Rich, of course, uh, I, I couldn't resist putting my book up here on my virtual background because Rich is the uh, author of the forward for me. So mm. uh, much appreciated that. And it's it's helped make, you know earned me a couple of awards for this particular book, all about CEOs. Several of them are in the IT expo world. <laughs> so uh, so the, the names aren't called out, but uh, people who know me can figure out the companies and the CEOs. Anyway, 
Um, I'm working on my second book, which is all about uh, CEO mistakes, mistakes that CEOs Ooh, make, and the top 77 mistakes that CEOs <laughs> make, how to avoid them if you haven't made it yet, and how to recover if you have. And I have uh, a, a re- kind of a release form for CEOs to fill out that want to be in the book. So there's a few CEOs who have, uh, are willing to put their story in the book. And uh, and I'm hoping that becomes more of a reference book. This is a book about stories about real life CEOs that I reported to this one here. But the next one is is uh, quite a bit different. It'll be more of a reference book to help CEOs and, and leaders really at all levels. Um, I've moderated the uh, this CEO Insights panel uh, since 2021. So it was the first event back after the pandemic, and it was slow, but it was a great event. And uh, I work with uh, Rich's team and uh, had that first platform with four CEOs. All the CEOs really are quite familiar with uh, IT Expo. Uh, some are, are uh, I think this year, they're all, at the event with a booth of some sort, but uh, but these people share their stories openly and they answer the questions and it's very great dialogue. And we've had better crowds each year, and I think this year will be even bigger because of uh, being on the Gen AI track. So uh, this year, can we explain that, that, Bill? The fact that there's a generative AI expo, it's co-located. One of the things about IT Expo that's kept it. Fresh, right? This is the 41st event, and we're very fortunate and blessed to have, you know, amazing people like the two of you guys coming down to the show, as well as many thousands of others. And uh, we think one of the big differentiators is that we've been on the leading edge of, you know, it's not just what's important today for 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 people, mm-hmm. right? We talk about today's mm-hmm. events, but also what's next, what's coming, mm-hmm. and this is now the second generative AI expo that's part of what we call a tech super show, which is kind of this. Uh, it's an overall umbrella, overarching umbrella of, of the event. And as one of um, a real smart PR person uh, told me at the show years and years ago, he said, you know, I think of this as like a mall. This event is like a mall, whereas other events are more like maybe a department store. But what our goal is to have enough information uh, at this event so that people can learn and become educated on all the important things they need to know about. And one of the hot topics, obviously, is generative AI. Now, granted, AI is almost in every industry. It's affecting every everything. But there is also a need to learn about AI itself because if you, you start looking at these various large language models and all these other uh, things that are coming up and, and out, like in terms of, you know, they're, they're amazing um Amazing services that will make graphics for you, like Midjourney and all these others that you can use to make graphics. You just need a track to keep track of everything. To get to, like, what, how do you become more productive? How do you become more efficient? How do you know what's the best large language model for for your particular niche or your particular industry or or you know your space? So, thankfully, Bill is is participating in that generative AI track, and we can't wait to uh, to hear what his uh, what's on his panels, uh, what what's uh, what we can learn from him, et cetera. Yeah, that's a Thanks, great Rich. opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Bill, and tell us, you know, what what's on uh, top of mind on many CEOs' minds? I, I know, Rich, you do get a lot of CEOs attending, either the vendors, their C-suite, you get uh, uh, small, medium-sized businesses, lots of business leaders, and CEOs uh, from the telcos. It really is a great place for the sweet, sweet C-suite as well as us tech geeks. What What's the sort of demographic of the show? Uh, Rich, who who will be attending? So it's a, it, believe it, like what you just said is is exactly explains it. The smaller companies are very high level, CXO level. So we'll get COO, mm-hmm. CEO, especially you know MSPs that are looking to come and find what they should be reselling to their to their customers. Uh, typically, those are smaller organizations, so you'll mm-hmm. get a higher level. Uh, a lot of the telecommunication service providers uh, will be sending like directors of engineering, engineering people, procurement people who are making decisions on purchasing. Uh, in the enterprise space, um, it's a mix. It really is a mix. But really, it, it comes down generally to IT people, right? The people that are mm-hmm. dealing with the IT. Uh, sometimes it'll it'll bubble over, you know, sideways, I guess, go over to the C-suite in terms of the people that are looking to boost productivity and aren't necessarily primarily the tech people. 
And, you know, mm -hmm. there are so many sessions, there's hundreds of sessions at the show mm -hmm. that you can, you can go into and learn. So it really, it, it prevents, or it, it, I guess it allows you to come to a show and really look at technology from multiple angles. You can learn about how to become more productive. You can learn about what technology is the best in a particular area. Uh, you can spend time with your peers, right? There's networking events. So it's really, I mean, we look at it as three days of invaluable education that could literally take weeks or months to do elsewhere if you're on the internet just searching because, you know, ultimately uh, there are reviews on the internet, but, you know, even when I'm on, let's say, large e-commerce sites, I never know if the reviews are real. Are they paid reviews? I, I just don't know. But when I go to a conference, I can speak to customers and I can speak to other customers and I can speak to partners. And ultimately I get a sense of this, you know, what I'm, learning about is real and I can ask about the real challenges of implementation and what are the benefits. And, you know, I get a sense in person that, you know, this is a legitimate, a legitimate response. Whereas online it's a little bit more difficult to do that. And you just wouldn't have access to these people online, even if you were trying to replicate it, you really have to go to a live event to maximize your, your time, you're out of the office, you're focused. And, um, you know, it's just a jam packed, Three days of excitement, education, and uh, choosing products for the rest of the year, right? This is the budget cycle for most companies. They come during the budget cycle to figure out what do they need to buy to make their 2024 the best year ever. Yeah, such a great uh, point. And, uh, you know, Bill, tell us on the you know CEO Insights blog, what are some of the themes and undercurrents that you're seeing is it the is it the worst time to be a ceo or the or the most exciting <laughs> uh time to be a oh, ceo or, or both so so this house works with a lot of startup founder ceos and uh and that's where i i kind of bring my expertise in is I, I don't even though i've worked at the multi-billion dollar corporations at the senior level i would much prefer to work with startups and small company CEOs, because I really, I mean, I functioned as a COO before in the hosted VoIP space. So I have a pretty good idea about every element of a company and, uh, and I can help a CEO. I can be, sit in a meeting for, you know, meetings for three days with every uh, function in a, in, in a small company and pretty much come away with knowing where the bumps and bruises are, uh, people that need to be moved around a little bit. People are in the, and this happens for the CEO. It's really hard because once you get to be the the top dog, everything is on your plate, and so you need to have the best team that you can trust under you. And this is the biggest problem for startup founders and small company founders is they don't want to let go. They don't like to let go. Uh, it's okay to be involved in the big decisions, every big decision, and the strategy is yours, and the direction is yours. And the highest level messaging is yours, but you've got to you've got to rally the troops around you. And a lot of the new people that, especially in the world since the pandemic, uh, you know, where there's so many people get laid off, they start companies. And if most of them don't come from a sales background, they come from a technical background. They're not very good as uh, overall business CEOs. They don't understand how to sell. And they have to be the sell, the sales guy, <laughs> right? Founder-led sales and founder-led marketing are very difficult uh, for a lot of these founders. So I can help bring these people through uh, through that phase. And you know, I today I'm mostly an advisor. Although for one particular client, I do a lot of the work. You know, I write do contracts for them and you know process plans and various other kinds of things, uh, and and help with their particular leadership team. Uh, and, and I do it, uh, really, I, I do it out of love more than anything. I mean, I'm semi-retired these days after five decades in the business myself. So uh, I love technology. I love what I do. I love IT Expo. I mean, it's the only actual article I wrote on my LinkedIn profile is about uh, the general trade shows versus the uh, vendor trade shows. And why IT Expo, and I wrote this several years ago, why IT Expo was was my favorite, actually. Because Rich and the team have reinvented themselves year in and year out. Like last year, three weeks in advance, the Gen AI, the Gen AI track was born. 
And yeah, it was new and it was just born. And I was on the MSP track last year. But what's interesting is that it's so hot. Everybody is talking about generative AI, but people are scared of it. Some people are scared of it. Some people are worried about it because of IP and copyright infringements. Mm. Uh, and some people love it because they figured out how to write prompts, how to make it work for you uh, in the process of making AI uh, your assistant and really do 75% of the of the the daily mundane tasks. So people are starting to learn how to do that. So the panel this year is the good, the bad, and the ugly of using generative AI for business. And um, I think it's a fantastic topic. Like we talked about this last fall, Rich, and it's actually better now than it was <laughs> of a topic now than it was then because so much stuff happens every single day. There's new mm. tools every day. There's new everything every day. And it's not just marketing or sales. It's coding and engineering development process and QA process. I had I had lunch with the, the old QA team from Fiber Mountain, I don't know, a few months ago. And ChatGPT is on my phone. It's a you know, I use it all the time, but uh the the plus version. And so I said, have you ever used ChatGP? The guy who runs at, at a new company now, the guy who runs QA says, No. I said how long does it take you to write a test plan? <laughs> and he tells me, you know, weeks, really. So I said, okay, give me the answer to these three questions. So I wrote a prompt to answer the three questions that he gave me. And he sat there and watched this thing come through my phone in about 35 seconds. And he had a whole draft test plan. I said, uh -huh. you don't have to use this. This just give you an idea how powerful this is. So it's That's interesting that you're saying that, Bill, because uh, – you know, some of the notes that we were batting around before this call, one of the interesting topics that happened in the last couple of days is that our fourth quarter gross domestic product was released. And it's basically a, it, it's a an addition of all the products and services produced by the United States. And uh, we we have been told by many people that there is going to be a recession and that the economy is going to get worse. And that typically means that the amount of products and services produced, GDP, decreases. And in this case, it increased by 3.3, which was higher than expected, 3.3%. Mm -hmm. And the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, said that the reason for that is because there was an increase in productivity. Now, we haven't seen a massive increase in productivity in quite some time. Mm -hmm. Can anybody guess why there might have been a productivity mm -hmm. boost in the last quarter? Okay. Should I play the theme to Jeopardy here? Ding, well, it's because yeah, I, I think we have a few guesses, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 90 90 percent what i've seen from gartner is that over 90 percent of uh ceo well not ceos but marketing and sales executives have started to implement ai in their business process now some of them are just taking straight ai content and that's a mistake you have to i mean you have to learn how to because you're an expert it's a combination of your expertise plus knowing how to ask the right questions and then AI can can come and automate and edit this stuff, can do copy editing, can do all kinds of neat things. And it takes all the mundane freaking tests that it used to be, you know, you could you could ask it to write an outline for something. You could go through a let's say the two hundred let's say there's a two hundred and eighty page report out of the government. You can feed that in to upload that PDF document into one of the Gen AI tools. And it'll give you a complete summary of it for you. And it'll do it in a number of words that you ask it. You can Bill, do it. Is it in fair to say that there's a difference also between what we're talking about here, which is just the general individual use of AI and the corporate implementation or the business implementation, right? So it's more than, right? Yeah. Anybody could just go into ChatGPT and do some of these things. But the question mm -hmm. becomes, how are you going to integrate this into your business in a way that improves many of the different areas? Because ultimately, all competition or all businesses is competitive. And we're, we're all dealing with uh, profit numbers and pricing models. And, you know, ultimately, there's a race to zero in a lot of different businesses because mm -hmm. things get commoditized. So it's basically the companies that are able to figure out how to be the most productive and are able to price properly. Now, whether they keep those margins as profit and 
maybe spend more money on marketing or however they want to run that part of the business, mm -hmm. that's up to them. But if you are able to maximize productivity and minimize cost better than the next guy, you are going to be in a great position. And the earlier you put those policies in place in your organization and the, the procedures and choose the tools, the better position you're going to be in, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, also I think, think, I think your yeah. companies, uh, just to follow on that point, Rich, I mean, GoDaddy, we saw Google replacing customer facing customer service positions with AI. So, you know, to be competitive, it's going to be, you know, table stakes, I think, to implement these kind of solutions, is it not? Yeah, and I think it's not there yet in some places, right? So, for example, customer facing, it can be good. It can be, it be good. It can be good for certain things, right? But ultimately, you may want to kick it back to a human at some point. But it's getting better and better and better. And the companies mm -hmm. that are starting to experiment with it now and figure out how to replace, for example, customer facing with AI, the, the sooner they do that, the better. And whether they do it in conjunction with humans, however they want to do it, is up to them. And this may not be, it may not work for every company. But the majority of customer service is going to be or customer facing uh, roles are eventually going to be AI driven. And I know that there's going to be pushback for some time from some people. But we saw the same kind of pushback with automated um, phone systems, uh, automatic call distributors that were invented, let's say, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago where uh, you call the company and it said, press one for this, press two for that. There used to be humans. And there was pushback for a number of years. But ultimately, to be competitive, companies had to ad adopt this automation within their telephone systems. And now, to be competitive, companies are going to have to adopt this automation anytime that they are communicating with end customers. It just, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at this, this is what's going to happen. You don't have any choice. Uh, yes, you can be, a, maybe you're the single exception because you have a very, very high margin product, right? Like Rolls Royce may not need to do this, right? Bentley may not need to do this. Understood, right? Tiffany may not need to do this. But for most people, they're in a competitive market that's getting ever more commoditized. It becomes very difficult to compete if you've got 30 people on the phone and your competitor has one or two people on the phone for escalation. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those responses are coming from machines. You're not going to effectively compete, which means you're not going to be able to price match if you need to do that to keep customers and eventually you lose market share. And that's just a bad recipe for a long-term future for any organization. Yeah. You know, a lot of companies that have developed these IVR systems over the years. And when you call customer service, you go, you get sent around and around and around and never get a human or you never get an answer. The AI systems that they're putting now into contact centers. Uh, if you think about it, they have the knowledge base built in. So a level one call can actually answer probably 70 or 80 percent of the questions. And and you don't go into this if they've implemented AI and obviously customize it for their particular company and service. They can get the whole knowledge base built into this AI tool. And unless it's a very unique, you know, kind of a problem that as long as you give them an out to escalate to, a, you know, to a live person, most of those questions are going to be answered, which now increases customer satisfaction, not decreases it in the past. And that's where I see a lot of things changing. And I, I see companies and CEOs that I talk to that are doing that and doing various kind of applications to enhance their service. You know, on, on the panel, the thing that people coming to my panel the last three years have told me is, you know, I give away some free signed books at the, you know, 10 books at the end of my panel. If people stick around for a few minutes and all meet me and talk to me and give me feedback, one of the things that they tell me is they've never been to a session like this before to hear the insights, actual insights of the CEO based on my questions. And when you look at these, the three people that are CEOs of very successful companies, and m many of them are multiple CEOs, they're not new founder CEOs, they're longtime mm -hmm. veterans, Dave George, Bill McLean, and Dan. Dan Rosenrausch. And these guys will share insights, what they're thinking, what they're doing in their companies. And Bill McLean has become one of the one of the uh, uh, principles of upon AI, which are now building UCAS applications around AI. 
for their for their businesses that that are prime you know that primarily sell uh you know to this customer base that's going to be at IT Expo. So he has real customer stories I'm sure that are within the last 6 to 9 months as well as running his companies. He's got a couple of companies but he's also now doing this upon AI stuff which is all AI applications and they're learning the true problems that customers have and they're trying to solve them as uh you know call me, kind of call management type of things. So these people these CEOs and and it's blowing me away every year. They share their true deep insights. Unfortunately, it's only forty five minutes. I wish it was an hour and forty five minutes because there's enough questions and and people are just interested in the audience. And when I and take I, a poll, it's a mix. You know, Bill, the CEOs. I just want to make sure that I give a plug, a, a proper plug. Um, there are people I've spoken with in private equity that uh, have your book as as required reading. Give me the title again. Give us the title. It's the Ricky CEO. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. So your book is actually required reading uh, in <laughs> private equity firms. So um, just an FYI, it's pretty impressive. So because, you know, you, you were a, a tech guy, a marketing guy, and then you went into writing books and, uh, you know, you reached out to me, you said, Hey, can you write the forward? And I was thinking to myself, what does Bill know about writing books? He's never written a book before. <laughs> but, you know, and I like this guy. He's smart. He knows his stuff. All right, I'll write the forward. I wrote the forward. And lo and behold, I have people reaching out to me now saying, oh, my God, you wrote the forward in Bill's book. It, it's required reading. So it's really exciting. Congratulations. Well, and, Rich, Thanks. you can write the forward for my next book, which will be written by ChatGPT. But you can write the forward <laughs> in ChatGPT. So it'll be and you just have real – Write my forward for me, or, or, can, or do I do that? I don't know. I'm very confused already. But there's so much goodness happening at IT Expo, <laughs> including uh, a number of uh, Friday fun here. N never, never a dull moment. Um, including co co-located uh, events like the Future of Work Expo and, and more. Tell talk about that, Rich, and also what are the themes at the Future of Work Expo? Because that's a really hot topic now with hybrid work. And, you know, things like the uh, I saw an article here, Bank of America threatening uh, workers who don't return to office with disciplinary actions and, you know, all, all kinds of uh, drama happening out there in the world of work. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there are there are numerous co-located events at this show. And just to give you a quick overview of the topics that are at the show, there's co-located events on IoT, future of work, obviously generative AI we've talked about. Uh, Asterisk, which is a, there's an Astrocon show, which is an open source communications platform. There's an expo on 5G, an enterprise metaverse expo, an industrial IoT event, a smart city event, and one on customer experience. But to specifically answer your question regarding the future of work, uh, you mentioned Bank of America is upset that people have not come back to the office and they're going to threaten disciplinary action. And I also did a post on LinkedIn recently about this. Uh, this device you can plug into your laptop and it, it it simulates movement of your mouse. And the reason they do that is because a lot of employers are tracking mouse movement as a way to ensure their employees are actually working. And in my post, I said, you know, this is just really crazy in a post COVID world that management hasn't come up with better solutions than to track mouse movement to make sure that people are working right. There, there are, there are, we now have collaborative tools. We have all sorts of ways of ensuring that people are productive and collaborating and efficient, regardless of where they are. And, and it's obvious that um, the people that are just tracking mouse movement and tallying that as a way to ensure that they, you know, whether they fire you or keep you or whatever they do with that information, that they're not, they're obviously not maximizing the productivity of their workforce. So Future of Work Expo is all about the technology and the systems and procedures and processes that companies need to implement today to deal with the hybrid workforce, which for better or for worse, it's a hybrid workforce. People don't want to work 100% in the office. And if you force them, you will not have access to the world's best people. Why? Because other companies will allow flexible work. And subsequently, the best workers will go to the companies that allow the flexible work. So by definition, if you're 100% in an office, you are not getting the best workforce. That's, I'm not trying to be offensive mm -hmm. to people who are working in an office. 
I'm just saying that, you know, people have now gotten used to this flexibility and the really talented people will find work. So that's one of the challenges that enterprises have to deal with. And so that means that since the world has changed so much and we can't rely 100 percent on on physical walls to kind of house our work, we now need to implement software policies and procedures that replace what was once the four walls of the enterprise and companies still have it some have many companies have not done that but there are so many tools so many procedures so many processes that you can implement that are going to um, allow you to be even more productive than you would be in the office and uh, someone may be watching this and say, oh, I have to spend money on that. Oh, my God, I don't want to spend money on that. Well, if you're an enterprise, think about spending a small amount of money on the hardware and software as opposed to the massive amount of money that you are spending on real estate and related expenses. You're going to reduce your real estate expenses, take mm. some of that money, put it invested into productivity tools, keep your team, number one, happy, number two, motivated, number three, communicating and collaborating efficiently and effectively, right? So now what are you talking about? Lower real estate costs, uh, higher productivity from your team, a happier team, and now you've got coworkers that are going to talk to their friends and their other high value uh, colleagues and say, yeah, this is a great company. You want to work for them too. You're going to attract even better talent, right? So for those companies who understand this, they are going to do great for the companies that are forcing you into an office. And, and I don't mean to, you know, I don't want to say anything derogatory about the specific, you know, example, but it just happens that Bank of America was in the news this week. It's going to be really tough to attract the best of the best talent out there. So that's that's just the reality that we're all going to have to deal with. Right. You either you either adopt these tools, become proficient in using them, invest in them. Or you're not going to have access to the best talent and you're going to become less competitive over a period of years. Wow, such a such a great point. And uh, any any we wrap, want to wrap this up, but any final thoughts, Bill, on, uh, you know, planning to be in Fort Lauderdale? Uh, what's on your mind in advance of the event and maybe a call to action? Can folks reach out to you and connect to, to meet up and where can they do that? Sure. So um, if if anyone does want to meet me, they can obviously come to my panel and talk to me uh, before or after, uh, which is Wednesday morning. Um, it is uh, February 14th at 9 a.m., nice, bright and early. Uh, and uh, it's they're 45 minutes, and then there's plenty of time afterwards. Um, I will be going, I think, to the Cloud Voice Alliance suite where they have a I think they have a room for from 10 to 12 or something like that. And since I'm an advisor there and I do their CEO success story webinars, uh, I will be, uh, which is also a, you know, it's a Q and a kind of like this, right. <laughs> but just two of us. And, uh, that'll be from 10 to 12. Uh, if you want to send me a message specifically, you can go to my LinkedIn or my, you know, my website really has everything, which is, uh, beelinebuild.com spelled beeline. It's my, my brand online. Uh, and I also have a, a link tree with all of my links to the books and everything else. So just, again, it's beeline bill. So that just do a search for beeline bill and you'll find, find everything. Uh, you can find Rich Durrani associated with my book. If you just do a search on the book, <laughs> like Barnes and Noble, who can, who sells, uh, just the hardcover, uh, they actually list Rich Tarani as an author the way they the way they do it because he's listed on the cover of the book. It's really interesting. He is the author of that section, which my editor, by the way, thought was a great piece of writing. I think I told you that, Rich. Oh, thank uh, you so much. She didn't make one change to your forward. She felt it was just well done. Anyway, so I will be there. Um, you know, again, beelinebill.com. There's a, a contact form you can uh, reach out to me there. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, connect, and uh, just make a comment about this uh, this session and just mention IT Expo or something, and uh, we can set something up. And then uh, uh, my partner, Connie, is going to be there with me, and she is doing fractional marketing services. So uh, she'll be at my session, and she'll be at the event as well. Uh, and she works with a lot of these startup founders and small company founders in marketing. So we'll be there and 
we're happy to happy to talk to people. We'll be there. I'll be flying in Monday night and uh, leave Thursday. So see you in Fort Lauderdale. Very exciting. Yeah, I'll be flying in a few days before and leaving a week later. So you know, this is a great Ooh. tax write off for for me, Rich. Thank you <laughs> for that opportunity. And it's not it too late, that. right, Rich? I mean, it is not too late to attend, but also to sponsor, uh, to participate in, in, in different panels. Uh, what else? Evan, we've got hundreds of people at a time that are signing up to come to the show, and we've got uh, somewhere in the order of five new people saying they have to be in the show on a daily basis still right now. Airfares are relatively low. Hotel prices are relatively low. And I say like compared to like a Vegas you can get to mm. Lauderdale or Miami. You use either airport really inexpensively. And, um, you know, we're expecting just an amazing turnout. And like you said, Evan, I mean, what I like about the Fort Lauderdale event is that it's, uh, on the one hand, Florida is a relaxed environment. It's not crazy like some of the other trade show cities. But simultaneously, you're going to be able to network with some of the best, brightest people out there, uh, your colleagues in in the world of um, whatever world you're in, whether you're, like I said, a communication service provider, an enterprise or, you know, reseller, which is channel or MSP, you're going to find your colleagues at the show. And you're also going to find some of the best of the best uh, companies at the show represented, you know, from, from IBM and Cisco and Avaya, who've got great keynotes and, and Genesis uh, and, and just a ton of amazing exhibits. I can't mention them all as hundreds, but uh, please take a look at the exhibitor list and the speaker list, and you will not be disappointed. So we're, we're really excited about our 25th year show. And, you know, thank you all for making it possible. Those of you that have watched to the end, you're probably uh, diehards or fans of the, of, the, of the event. And we really appreciate you. And we're looking forward to hosting you in a few weeks in Fort Lauderdale. Fantastic. Can't wait to see you guys. Uh, can't wait to see many of you watching, rewatching out there and uh really look forward to it and have a great weekend guys same here yeah. thanks very much thank you thanks guys take care yep.